What is a black Muslim besides a Negro? And what is the movement? Is it a bona fide religion or just a terror organization? Tonight on Stammer Our Contact, we're going to have a look at the Muslims and the black nationalists in general. And my guest tonight, Malcolm X, once the number two man in the black Muslims, now broken with Elijah Muhammad, he says he's a marked man and that a number of attempts have been made on his life. And also in the studio, uh, we hope very shortly, Aubrey Barnett, there's been some difficulty tonight just before airtime, and Aubrey may join us and he may not. Uh, he's also split from the organization, and he's written an article in this week's Saturday Evening Post labeled simply, The Black Muslims Are a Fraud. And uh, here is Aubrey Barnett now. And my third guest tonight, Gordon Hall, an expert on extremist organizations. Aubrey Barnett, in your article, you call the black Muslims a fraud. Now, does this just apply to the mosque's methods of raising money or what? Do you think it's a religious fraud as well? I think the entire black Muslim movement is a fraud. And uh, Webster's Dictionary defines a fraud as deceit, trickery, or a trick. The black Muslims have deceived the public. They've used trickery on trying to attract the Negroes, and they have outright tricked the poor black Muslim members. That's why I say they are a fraud. Uh, now, okay, they've tricked them. Now, this is in terms of the religion itself as well as the mon money raising. Well, right. As far as the religion of, of Islam is concerned, I might say right here that any similarity between the black Muslims and the true religion of Islam is purely coincidental. Malcolm X, uh, I said at the outset that you were once the number two man. I think I can rightfully say that easily. You were certainly uh, as well known as, almost as well known, or as well known as Elijah Muhammad. Uh, but I never was the number two man. You never were the and number the two man. I said I was the number two man, but there were others ahead of me. How do you feel about this comment from Aubrey Barnett? Now, what he's saying is true, especially about the first, especially about the religion. The uh, religion of Islam itself is a religion that uh, is based upon brotherhood and a religion in which the persons who believe in it in no way judge a man by the color of his skin. Uh, the yardstick of measurement in Islam is one's deeds, one's conscious behavior. And the uh, yardstick of measurement that was used by Elijah Muhammad was based upon the color of the skin. Malcolm, it wasn't too long ago that you were preaching uh, separation, black supremacy, You were, or, or separation at any rate, if not black supremacy. It sounded like black supremacy to a lot of people. How do you uh, equate that now, what there's, you're saying today? There's not one person who is a Muslim who believes in Elijah Muhammad today who believes in him more strongly than I did. When I was with him, I believed in him 100%. And it was my strong belief in him that made me go along with everything he taught. And I think if you check back on my representation of him while I was with him, I represented him 100%. What is your status now, Malcolm? How do you mean? Right now. Uh, I'm a Muslim. Broken? When I, when I, you, you must understand that the black Muslim movement, although it claimed to be a religious movement based upon Islam, it was never acceptable uh, to the orthodox Muslim world. And uh, although at the same time it attracted the most militant, the most dissatisfied of the uh, black community into it, and by them getting into it and the movement itself not having a real action program, it uh, comprised a number of persons who were extremely young and militant but who could not, and who were activists by nature but who couldn't participate in things. So the inactivity of the movement caused a great deal of dissatisfaction until finally dissension broke in and division, and those of us who left regrouped into a, 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 mu a Muslim movement based upon Orthodox Islam. So now that you've broken away, uh, let me ask you a, a question, of, and this calls for numbers. You're no longer a member. Are you in a, in a membership fight now with Elijah no, Muhammad? No, I have never at any time involved myself in a membership fight with Elijah Muhammad. In fact, if you go back to the release that I made public at the time of my official departure, I pointed out that I was in no way trying to take away the followers of Elijah Muhammad, but that I myself was going to become a Muslim, but would work among the 22 million non-Muslim Negroes and try to establish some kind of program that would be beneficial to the black American period. There were a lot of numbers that were thrown around some time ago. I guess it was two years ago or so, and the numbers said something like 100,000 Muslims across the United States. And uh, you and your article, Aubrey Barnett, talk about these numbers. You, you specify quite clearly. And you ask a question at one point. You say, how large was our membership? The most accurate estimate I ever heard of our strength in Boston came during a radio debate between Gordon Hall, a specialist on extremist organizations, and Malcolm X. And that radio debate took place on Bob Kennedy contact in Boston. 
our sister station, WBZ, uh, held that debate between you, Gordon, and, uh, and Malcolm X. And I heard the tape of that debate. It was quite heated. And uh, it was a very good debate. It was very entertaining, and I enjoyed it. What did you do? Um, what now, when you talk about numbers today? And you, Aubrey, mentioned in your article, you say something like 55 members in all of Boston, 57 in another place. I say... Small membership numbers. I'm speaking of, of the present membership of the Moss right now. Uh, in Boston, they have probably 55 male members, and uh, uh, Springfield, probably uh, 35 or 40, and uh, Providence, Rhode Island, maybe 10 or 15 members. The membership has just about dwindled in half. And before I uh, comment on, on the actual uh, sense of the movement at its peak, I'd like to uh, add something to what uh, Malcolm had just said, that not only did the black Muslim movement attract dissatisfied Negroes, and uh, it attracted Negroes who were, uh, contrary to the public, uh, the popular public belief, they did uh, attract some Negroes who were doing very well in the world, but who Negroes who thought that the black Muslims had a program for improving the condition of the Negro in America. Uh, I was one of those Negroes. I was not very much dissatisfied uh, a as an individual when I came to the Muslim movement, but I knew that there was a problem existing in the Negro community. I knew that uh, uh, many Negroes were suffering from discrimination. They were frustrated, and there were many problems that would be set in our communities. And I thought that Muslims, black Muslims had a, a program for economic upliftment a program of moral upliftment. I thought that the Muslims had a program for combating juvenile delinquency. And you saw this as a myth now. I see it as a myth now. I see. Gordon, uh, you, you have been a, a critic of all extremist organizations. Uh, you sort of pinpointed uh, the strength of the Muslim organization. And you say that the strength is basically a myth with these 100,000 numbers. How, do, how did you arrive at your own figures? Well, I do this work full-time to begin with, and I've done this work for close to 20 years. And when you follow extremists around, whether they're Negro extremists or white extremists, if you follow the Klan around the way that I did and penetrated their movements and found out numbers, you find out that they make a lot of noise, all out of proportion to their numbers, just as currently the Negro nationalists in the New York area are making noise all out of proportion to their numbers. And uh, I think the real tip-off, Stan, came when... Uh, Elijah was supposed to speak at the uh, Boston Arena a few summers ago, I think it was July of 1962, and I flew back from the speaking day to Minneapolis and told the press that they couldn't possibly fill the Boston Arena, which seats 7,200 people, even if they brought in all of the um, people from the other mosques around the eastern seaboard, Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and so on. I also predicted that Elijah Muhammad would not show up that he's an incoherent old man, he does not speak well, he doesn't make any sense in his public appearances, and I felt that Malcolm probably would carry the load that day, and it worked out precisely that way. This was a prediction long before they even opened the doors in the arena. And then, lo and behold, despite all the efforts to allow the white public in, plus all the sisters and brothers and all the, the uh, fiddle-faddle about the whole show, they couldn't even fill downstairs in the arena. And they and brought was, in 3,000, I think, was the figure, right? Yes, something like that. And that was the clear tip-off to me that this thing was built on quicksand, that they've never had any members, really. And this is pretty much the history of extremist movements in general, that they make noise all out of proportion to their numbers. This was based, really, on the reality of the situation and not listening to all the... What grandiose year? statements made by uh, what year men was like that? Malcolm X. What year was that? Uh, I don't have the figures with me, Malcolm. I think it was the summer of 62, if I remember. Well, you, were the, you were the main you speaker. Ma you mentioned that, that in your article, and you say there were 3,000 there, and uh, and Malcolm, you were the main speaker. I know a lot of the, white people the, there, too. The, uh, no, there were about 200, which was a lot <laughs> for those days. But I think you'll find that the Muslim movement reached its peak in uh, strength in 1960, 59 and 60, and it began to taper off in 61 and in 62. Do you agree with uh, Aubrey's figures that the peak strength was about 15, 13 to 15,000? Uh, that be your estimate as well of the total Muslim movement? No, the, the peak uh, in 19... Yes. In the peak in 1959 and 60 uh, was reached. But it began to go down after Elijah Muhammad uh, took a trip abroad, plus became involved in other personal problems. And the movement itself began to deteriorate only after Elijah Muhammad put uh, members of his own family in positions of authority, which weakened the structure and caused uh, internal bickering and division, and eventually the movement just petered out. Gentlemen, we're going to get back to this in one moment. It's time for us to make a little money. It's the way you know, the show survives all the time. East side, west side, all around the town. Another money-saving ShopRite supermarket comes to Patterson, New Jersey. 
at 142 160 West Broadway in Patterson. Open now and ready to serve you everything you could possibly want in meats, fish, shellfish, fresh produce, canned and frozen foods, baked goods, and dairy products. And there's a convenient service appetizer department, too. There's plenty of free parking, and the store is open late every night of the week. If you can't get to Patterson, get to the ShopRite supermarket nearest you and cash in on the carnival of grand opening celebration value. So why pay more? Shop ShopRite in Patterson, 142, 160 West Broadway. The wind's contact number, Judson 2, 6405. That's J-U-2, 6405. You have a question tonight. Tonight is the night. Yes, sir. Just one more point, Stan. I think the whole... Um point of this last discussion between uh, Aubrey and Malcolm and myself would be to uh, point out that the three of us agree that of a peak figure of, say, 15,000, regardless of the year, whether it was 1960 or 59, this is far below what the press had been estimating all over the country. And 15,000 Muslims uh, in any country are not very many Muslims when you figure that we have, let's say, a, um, uh, a Negro population of close to 22 million. This is just a drop in the bucket. See, Eric Lincoln came up with a figure of 100,000. Because he doesn't study extremists. That's why he came up with no, that figure. No, I, I have to uh, contend with that, and I won't, go, uh, I won't go along with what you're saying. In what way? Malcolm, in what way? See, Eric Lincoln is the person who was probably first in to mention a number in regards to black Muslims. But you will never find any figure given out at any time in any way, not by me, uh, concerning the numerical strength of the Muslims. I have never stated. My, my standing answer was that the best part of the tree is the root. And uh, I never defined the extent of the tree beyond that. Well, I, I, don't, I don't quite follow The thing you have to is. consider, uh, Mr. Hall, is like when you say that when you study extremist groups, usually they're very small and don't have much of an impact upon the public or drawing among the public. Uh, whether you're in the north, south, east, or west here in the states, where the nationalists are concerned, usually nationalists have an anti-press. Whereas the civil rights groups, or that he, the accepted civil rights groups, usually the press, the the city government, all of the uh, machinery that has to do with uh, public molding public opinion, goes along with civil rights groups. And whenever they're giving something, they have everything going for them toward promoting what they're giving. But when it comes to the nationalists. Usually you'll find that they have to almost fight their way into print in advance if they're going to give something. And despite that, uh, those obstacles and that uh, type of organized opposition, still you'll find the nationalist, nationalist groups, especially in the New York area, command a large following. I'll give you an example. This coming Sunday at 2 o'clock at the Audubon Ballroom, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, which I'm presently involved in, which is considered nationalist, are having a rally, and you are welcome to attend that. White, black, brown, red, yellow, green, or whatever else you have. And I think you'll find that despite the fact that we get no help whatsoever from the press, that we're able here in the New York area to attract larger crowds to our rallies than any other kind of rally that's given, and, they're, and they're, they are given the complete support of the press. But that doesn't prove anything, Malcolm, because Harlem is a big place. You'll you'll get a lot of uh, Negroes in. You'll get curious whites. That doesn't. That's not your membership. No, well, nobody. Just speaks. as just as when the Listen. Grand Dragon of the Klan speaks on campus, he will outdraw the vice president. He doesn't have to have membership to uh, still be the influencing factor in the South. You can't tell me that the Klan is a handful of people in Alabama, and then the whole government is supposed behind Martin Luther King. And a handful of Klansmen are keeping Dr. King in jail and, and marching Negro children down the road? I'm not saying that at all. Well, you, then you can't say that extremist groups are not effective and, and, and do not uh, uh, represent an influencing factor I'm in, in this society. Muslims, Gentlemen, I'm saying Muslims, Muslims, and the Negro community are not question. an important factor. I have a question <laughs> to this point. But the Klan is an important factor in the white community. It, it has been historic, yes. Right. Malcolm, you say attempts have been made on your life. And uh, that was at this afternoon's press conference. You say five different attempts recently. How were they attempted? Yes, uh, more than five. Of course, there was the bombing of the house. We yes. know about that occurred Sunday. Uh, uh, yes, first I would like to point out about that bombing of the house because the press has also been used uh, during the past week to imply that I bombed my own house. I would like to point out right here and now that I have no life insurance. My wife has no life insurance. I have four baby girls, none of whom have life insurance. We don't have health insurance. We don't have fire insurance. We have no kind of insurance whatsoever. And the only uh, uh, group 
<laughs> that stood to gain anything from the bombing of that house was the black Muslim movement in which the insurance is uh, uh, actually, the, the insurance is in their name. And I, I uh, really felt hurt that the press would allow itself to be used to give the public the impression that I would throw a, bu that I would throw a bomb or light a fire to a home in which my family, which my wife and family are asleep. Uh, the uh, deputy chief, uh, Deputy uh, Chief Fire Marshal, I think his name is uh, Vincent, McCan uh, Vincent Canty, pointed out to me uh, in the presence of witnesses on that same night that a fireman picked up a bottle of gasoline from my living room that had not exploded. And because this bottle of gasoline was in a whiskey bottle, this fireman placed that uh, a bottle on the dresser in my baby's room thinking that it was a bottle of whiskey. And when my wife came in and saw the bottle there, she asked the fireman, what was it? And the fireman said, it was whiskey. And well, we know that there's no whiskey in our house. And so she touched it and said, this isn't whiskey, this is something inflammable. And then they took it out. Now, despite that, the uh, deputy uh, marshal, deputy uh, fire chief marshal, having this knowledge and the uh, uh, police having this knowledge, still this knowledge is, is uh, kept back from the press. And in the vacuum that exists, then this man, James, down at 116th Street, steps in and tries to give the impression that uh, all of this was done by me. And I think that it is uh, a worse injustice on the part of the press and the police and the firemen to let such uh, impression be given, even then the people who threw the bombs in the house themselves. Aubrey, you were attacked in Boston by a group that you say were members of a Muslim goon squad. How did that come about? Right, well, I, I think I should be angry with Malcolm because I think, in a way, Malcolm was responsible for my being attacked. And uh, the reason I was attacked, because the black Muslim movement, losing strength, uh, had to build an enemy. And the enemy they projected was the black nationalists. Now, because I had left the mosque and, and uh, put the black Muslims behind, they branded me as a black nationalist, even though I had left the mosque some time before Malcolm ever followed me in the mosque. I was still accused of being a follower of Malcolm, although they should have turned around and said Malcolm was following me since That's I left right. first. But anyway, I, I can testify to the brutality of the black Muslims because I was viciously attacked by the black Muslims and put in the hospital for a week with a, a fractured... I, rather, I was hospitalized for a week and at home, uh, in bed for another week, I had a fractured rib, a, a fractured ankle, two fractured vertebrae, and internal injuries. And the reason I was attacked was primarily because I had the audacity to quit the black Muslim movement. And uh, I might point out, as far as the black Muslims manufacturing stories, one of the most fantastic stories I ever heard was the black Muslims' testimony in the trial in which they were, incidentally, were all found guilty of assault and battery on myself and the other you fellow who was charges. Me. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, one of the first uh, cases in the country where uh, a black Muslim ex-member had press charges against the, the uh, black Muslims for, for being beat up. Uh, I'm not the first one who was beat up. I'm the first one who uh, actually took the, had the, the courage to take them into court. And uh, it, during this trial, uh, they made some outrageous charges. First of all, they charged that uh, John Timas and myself attacked the mosque. Two men attacked the mosque. Uh, you are a mighty 135 pounds. I, I, was 100, I weigh 130 pounds soaking wet. And with all my clothes on, and probably with a pair of combat boots on, I'm not weighing 130 pounds. But anyway, I, uh, John Timas and myself attacked the mosque where there may be, uh, according to the black Muslim members, they would have you believe there was a thousand members there. But uh, there are only probably 55, but two men against 55 is, is pretty good odds. But this is the story they gave, that I attacked the mosque, and during the, the course of the trial, uh, I went to the, after, after the, uh, I was attacked, I was taken to the city hospital by the Boston police. I stayed there for about two hours, and then the police took me to uh, the Beth I mean, I had myself transferred to the Beth Israel Hospital. Well, the lawyer during the trial said that uh, I got together with the Beth Israel Hospital and faked all of these injuries. I faked the x-rays showing my fractured rib. I faked the x-rays showing the... Uh, Who was the, the lawyer? The lawyer was uh, Edward Jacko. From New York from City? New York City. From Harlem? Uh, yeah. You mean Edward Jacko came to Boston? And, and accused you of faking these charges? Yes, uh, apparently he wasn't very familiar with the Beth Israel Hospital because it's one of the biggest hospitals in Boston. And uh, how I ever got, the, got together with the Beth Israel Hospital to fake these records was beyond me. And, and why the Beth Israel uh, didn't take him up on that is beyond me also. But they will fabricate any charges uh, uh, and make up the wildest stories. Gentlemen, we're going to get to the telephones in just one moment. Would you like to play an active part in education in your community? 
You can right now by helping the Board of Education to fill the vacancies on the local school board in your district, which is the link between your community and the New York City Board of Education. Wynn suggests that you write the coordinator of local school boards, 110 Livingston Street, Brooklyn, or you can call 596-8993 for further information. Applications must be submitted by March 15th. That's March 15th. Let's get right to the telephones. Uh, Will I ask him just a question? Was yes. Edward Jacko retained by the Muslims in Boston, or was he retained by the Chicago headquarters? He was uh, retained by the Chicago headquarters because the black Muslims were found guilty in lower court and advised by the judge to plead guilty and uh, pay me restitution, $2,000, for the damage that I sustained, and uh, he would give them a suspended sentence. But they, on orders of the Chicago, they appealed the sentence, and, and uh, they fired the other lawyer and uh, imported Edward Jacko from New York. Okay, let's get to our... You have One to quick comment on this general uh, discussion of the courts and such. Aubrey took his case into the courts, uh, placed it in the hands of what he feels is uh, the reasonably fair and uncorrupt courts and justices and so on, and his case has been settled. I would charge that Malcolm's one-sided account of what actually happened in his home and everything will have to be settled by the courts for investigation and all the rest. And I warn your listeners to not to be simply accept this at face value, but to watch the newspapers and see what does develop in this well, current well, case. Yeah, you made a comment. What do you mean by that? The case was set. I mean just what I said by Not that. satisfactory. Oh. These Muslims, I must point out, were given suspended sentences but they were against convicted. the law, against the laws of Massachusetts. The statutes of Massachusetts say that you cannot give a person a suspended sentence when he's been convicted of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. Well, there's another point. Uh, there were actual suspects in that case. And uh, let me say this about, uh, in terms of fair play, uh, in, in, on this... Uh, on the station, uh, the Muslims are going to have a chance on March 3rd to answer every single charge that has been made here tonight against them. Well, actually, they you should advised. have had the Muslims here tonight. Well, uh, there's a little problem with that, and uh, we are going to arrange a program for them, and they are going to be appearing, uh, including, and by the way, there's a good chance that Elijah Muhammad may appear on the program via the telephone. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to that, of course. We're trying to arrange that now. Uh, as soon as they were apprised uh, of the fact that you were coming on the program tonight, they asked for equal time. And although it doesn't have to come under the equal time provisions uh, by the FCC, we are going ahead and are giving them a program. Uh, I believe it's March 3rd or March 4th. But let's get to our telephones. We have an awful lot. That was lot not of... the point, however, that I made. My only point was this, Stan, simply that there are charges and counter charges leveled by dissident factions within the Negro community, the small dissident factions we're talking about tonight. But uh, these things will be thoroughly investigated by law enforcement agencies, including the FBI, and justice will be done in the end. Just as the Black Liberation Front will claim that they weren't really trying to blow up anything, but the evidence is clear that they were trying to blow up the Statue of Liberty, despite their charges now that they're being framed. Um, uh, Mr. Hall, today uh, we demanded uh, that, that the FBI launch an immediate investigation of the bombing of my home on Sunday morning. Very good, and I'm confident that my... Uh, because be we were charging a conspiracy on the part of some firemen, some policemen, and some newsmen to work together to cover up the part played by Elijah's followers in the bombing and to give the public the impression that I bombed it myself by withholding valuable information from the public and telling half-truth through the press. We demanded the FBI Very investigation. Good. Very good. And I pointed out that my attorney had suggested that I and my wife submit ourselves to a lie detector test and that every policeman and fireman who entered that house that night do likewise. And we also suggest to uh, the minister of the local temple here who represents Elijah... Uh, that he, too, submit himself to a lie detector test, and Joseph, the fat one, submit himself to a lie detector test since he has implied that the bombing was done by people other than himself. So we're not in any way, sir, ducking away from any kind of investigation. We just demand Very that good. it be done by an impartial body and that it be done immediately. Very good. Gentlemen, Very good. let's do a station break right about now. This is yours truly, WINS, the Group W station, Westinghouse Broadcasting for New York. We're going to get back to things in just about 40 seconds. Hey, Stella, do I need my umbrella? Should I bundle up extra warm? If you know, don't be slow. To me, what the weather really gonna be? Ooh. 
Partly cloudy and then becoming fair tomorrow. Colder with a high in the upper 30s. Clear and cold tomorrow night. The low, 20 to 25. And for Saturday, fair and continued seasonably cold. The current temperature, 36 degrees. What is a black Muslim besides a Negro? What is the movement? Is it a bona fide religion or just a terror organization? Tonight on San Bernard Contact, we're talking about black nationalism and my guests, Malcolm X, Aubrey Barnett. Aubrey is a former black Muslim official from Boston. He's uh, split from the organization and has written an article in this week's Saturday Evening Post labeled simply, The Black Muslims Are a Fraud. And it's not a simple article at all. It runs about seven pages and it's absolutely fascinating. And my third guest tonight, Gordon Hall, an expert on extremist organizations. You know, we haven't taken a single phone call yet, gentlemen, and I would like to very much right now. Let's find out what's going on out there. The wind's contact number, Judson 2, 6405. This is Stan Bernard. Contact, you're on the air. Yes, I'd like to say that uh, there's one thing about this business about Malcolm's home being bombed that really bothers me. Uh, the He charges that the black Muslims did this. Now, there's one thing. They happen to own this home. It's not Malcolm's home. It's the black Muslims' home. Now, it seems very odd to me that the black Muslims would uh, want to destroy their own property. It would seem uh, more likely to me that Malcolm X would want to destroy the black Muslims' property. In other words, that he would try to uh, just throw a couple of uh, innocuous bombs in there that aren't going to hurt anybody. Uh, he knows they're not going to hurt anybody. They won't do too much damage. And he'll have a lot of publicity for himself. And then he can charge all he wants to, I'll take a lie detector test, because he knows that a lie detector test is not admissible into, in court as evidence of anything. Malcolm, how do you answer that? I say this, that the black Muslim movement has never uh, had as their motive the acquiring of that home. The, the, the possession of the home itself means nothing. Elijah Muhammad lives in a $150,000 house in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, that house is worth less than $15,000. It's not the home itself, the material home itself, that is the object of the present uh, court battle. There's more to it than that. And anybody, uh, I should think people should question the deputy fire uh, marshal and the others who investigated the bombing out there that night and let them give their story as to whether or not I could have set those bombs. And this is why I say I charge the conspiracy on the part of some of the firemen and some of the police and some of the press to give the impression that I said it. Why and would it, they side with the black Muslim organization against you, though, Malcolm? Yeah, I don't understand that. Well, uh, why you, let, not let, them? Why them, let's not answer you? answer your question this way. Uh, the press, whenever I mention that an attempt has been made on my life, they uh, print it in such a way that I am uh, implying that uh, an attempt has been made. The black Muslim movement tried to kill me in uh, Los Angeles airport two weeks ago while I was in, in the uh, company of the Los Angeles police. The Los Angeles police stopped the TWA airlines from taking off. They slipped, they slipped uh, airlines uh, flight from taking off. They slipped me uh, into a private room onto the plane through the basement. Uh, because of the presence of these persons in the airport who were completely heedless of the presence of the police. Now, this airliner was held up an hour and a half. Every passenger aboard it was taken off. His luggage was searched. I was kept on the plane. My luggage was, was searched. And then the uh, TW airline security agent flew to Chicago from Los Angeles with me. I was met at the airport in, in Chicago by the assistant uh, attorney general of the state of Illinois, and at least 20 different detectives. I was held in their uh, custody for 24 hours. I appeared on the Cups and Nets show. When I came out of the studio, officials of the black Muslim movement in Chicago even tried to attack the police to get at me. This was the, the Los Angeles incident was not reported in the press. The Chicago incident was not reported in the press. A couple of days later, I appeared on uh, David Sustein's hotline uh, on a Tuesday night, February the 2nd. Entering the studio that night, the uh, police department had to clash with uh, about 30 members of the local black Muslim movement who tried to uh, inflict physical harm upon those who were appearing on the program. None of this was mentioned in the press whatsoever. Uh, now, went by this 
type of uh, incident being kept from the press, then when I jump out and say that somebody is trying to kill me, the implication is given that I'm trying to do some publicity seeking or that I'm just making these stories up. But the police department from coast to coast in this country have the black Muslim movement well infiltrated, just as they have any other group well infiltrated. They are well aware of these uh, plots and discussions that take place. Malcolm, they can stop I, them if they wanted Malcolm, to. Malcolm, as a member of the press, I have to say at this point that I've never heard anybody say to me or to anybody else, do not print anything about Malcolm X or do not or suppress a story. I have never heard that happen. When your house uh, was bombed, it was handled as a lead story all the way. And whenever anybody that I know who is a member of the press is apprised of anything to do with Malcolm X, you're news. Sir, but the, here's the point. I'm news as, as long as what the news is about is something to project me in the image of someone with horns. But when it comes to objective reporting on things, I have you on this program tonight. I have you on this program tonight, and I don't think anybody is knocking you, and I don't think anybody... I don't I, want to I, get I, this down I, I, No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm not dealing with your program. I'm not dealing with your program. I'm dealing with this, that the impression like this man here, who just called in, tried to imply that I bombed my own home. Now, if he were aware of the physical attempts that have been made upon my life during the past year, and the number of attempts that have been made, why, it wouldn't be difficult at all for him to see the uh, ease with which that particular movement can blow someone's house up. Gordon? May I suggest one of the reasons, Malcolm, why you have the kind of image that you have in the broad public? I saw you on television the day that your home was bombed, and I, too, am a public lecturer who travels from state to state giving lectures before large audiences. You were smiling, and you were about to board a plane to go to Detroit on the same day that your home was bombed, you carried out a speaking engagement. If that happened in my home, I would never think of leaving my loved ones for fear that something might happen while I'm gone. You got on the plane and went to Detroit and gave a lecture. The black Muslim movement had its origin, as you know. But is that not true well, that you did minute. that? I'm going, going to explain it. The black Muslim movement, as you, an expert, supposedly knows, had its origin in Detroit, Michigan. Now, those who are in the black Muslim movement symbolically uh, regard uh, Detroit as the Mecca the uh, root or the focal point of uh, the origin or beginning of Elijah Muhammad's movement in this, in this country. The fact that I was to appear at a rally in Detroit had been highly publicized in Detroit. My wife and I felt that one of the purposes of the bombing of the house was to keep me from going to Detroit. We discussed it, and she encouraged me not to delay my trip. I went to Detroit, made the speaking engagement, and flew right back here. The wind's contact number, Judson 26405. This is Stan Bernard. Contact, you're on the air. Hello? Yes. Hello, I'd like to address my question to Malcolm X. Go right ahead. Hello, uh, Malcolm? Yes, sir. Well, I don't sound, mean to sound rude, but uh, aren't you kind of a hypocrite because you went all around the country preaching uh, for the black Muslims? No, I think I'm quite honest because as long as I believed in what Elijah Muhammad was teaching uh, and what he represented... I, I represented him 100%. Now, I know how bad it makes me look to tell you today what Elijah Muhammad is doing. If that does not concern me. As long as I believed in him, I represented him. But there were things about Elijah Muhammad that his followers right now know and that I know. That, that uh, when he became faced with it, he didn't stand up to it as a man. And when he failed to be able to stand up to his own uh, problem as a man, it was then that those of us who left the movement realized not only was he not divine, but he wasn't even a man. Yes. And it was then that we began to re-examine all of what he taught, and I was fortunate enough to be able to go into the Muslim world and discuss the whole situation with the Muslims there, and I'm, since then I have been trying to practice the orthodox religion of Islam. But despite the fact that I'm trying to practice the orthodox religion of Islam, I don't blind myself to the fact that our people in this, in this country still have a problem that goes above and beyond religion, so we set up another organization that is not religious uh, in order for all of us uh, who want to participate in the struggle against these social, economic, and political evils in this country that confront our people can participate in them. And I don't think it's hypocritical at all for a person to be wrong and admit that he was wrong. Aubrey, I think it's hypocritical when you pretend to still believe in something when you cease believing in it. Aubrey, you stopped believing, too. Uh, you left the Muslim movement. You wrote this article, uh, The Black Muslims Are a Fraud. What were some of the specific things you saw in the movement that drove you away from it? 
Well, some of the uh, specific things that, that I saw that drove me away from it, well, I'll take, for, uh, for example, the economic myth. Uh, the Muslims in their propaganda have projected the thought that they had a, a vast economic empire in Chicago. This is one of the things that really attracted me to the movement. When I uh, first became aware of the movement, I was a college student, and I'd graduated from, I was just in the process of graduating from Boston University, and I got a degree in, a uh, Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration. And when I started attending meetings, they used to tell me about the big businesses they had out in Chicago. Uh, Eleven months after I joined the movement, I finally went and saw these big businesses. And they consisted of a grocery store, a barber shop, a restaurant, and a dress factory, uh, which had three power sewing machines in it. Uh, now, I was greatly disillusioned when I saw these things. and But this was the extent of the great uh, Muslim empire that... Uh, they had been speaking about so. Well, lately. was it just size? I mean, uh, a lot of people. You were were you just disappointed in, in the fact that the size wasn't everything that uh, everybody thought it was going to be? I was disappointed because they had uh, projected this as being. Uh, uh, in fact, in the literature, they had uh, described it as Elijah Muhammad had invented a great communal system where the people, you know, the Negroes could get together and build businesses that would employ, uh, give employment, you know, to all Negroes who needed jobs. And uh, when I got out there, I, I found out that these are businesses that Negroes had been establishing all across the country without uh, inventing any new communal system. Yeah, I'm very disappointed. About that economic, uh, what do you think is true? But I think I can shed a little clearer light on it. Uh, the businesses uh, that the uh, Muslim movement had established from coast to coast, all of them operated in the red. There was only one business in the entire uh, Muslim movement that operated in the black, and that was the restaurant there on uh, 116th Street right here in New York. In fact, the only businesses, the only Muslims in business who operated businesses in the black were the Muslims in the New York area. And one of the bones of contention that developed between the factions in the black Muslim movement was the jealousy that developed in Chicago toward the New York Muslims because they were more successful than the ones there in Chicago. Uh, there, there was another business, I think, that operated Which in the one? black, and that was the dress factory. Uh, and the reason that operated in the black was because they had a, a, a captive market. Uh, one of the things that the black Muslim members had to do was to buy these long robes for the women to wear. Now, although the Muslim women were encouraged to learn how to sew, they were also forbidden to sew their own garments. So they had to buy these garments from the dress factory in Chicago, which incidentally was owned by the daughter of Elijah Muhammad, Ethel Sharif. So this was a very successful business. Since uh, in order to buy all these outfits, you had to spend $200 uh, to get the complete outfit. Gordon? A point of fact, I think, that also should be mentioned in connection with the businesses, that most of the Muslim businesses stand around the country, those advertising in the paper and so on, uh, were not businesses established by men who joined the mosque and then became businessmen. They were businessmen who had established businesses who then joined the mosque and the Muslims claimed these businesses. As their own. Is that not true, Malcolm? In some, in part. Uh, I think there are instances where uh, one thing the uh, Muslim movement did do, uh, persons who never thought in terms of business, they would talk so much business, so much talk about business was uh, stress that many who didn't have any business knowledge at all would become involved in a business venture, and then that vi venture would, would fold, which actually was worse for the movement than it was good for the movement. And uh, But I want to point out that uh, the businesses in Chicago, as Elijah Muhammad has told me from his own mouth, were such a failure that he subsidized them himself. He used to run those businesses from money uh, uh, with money out of his own pocket so that they would serve as a front. And uh, he always pointed out that the... Uh, none of his, especially his sons and those around him, had any business ability, and it developed within them a lot of envy and jealousy toward the New York Muslims because the successful, the most, the most successful businessmen among the Muslims were those right here in the New York area. I've got to earn a little money right now. Top quality sale at all damn supreme supermarkets. Save, save, save on the finest meat. You'll know the difference the minute you taste it. This week's Dan's is featuring Morel's Pride Boneless, Skinless, Shankless, Fully Cooked Canned Ham, five pound size, two ninety eight. That's right, Morel's Pride Boneless, Skinless, Shankless Canned Ham, five pound size, for only two ninety eight. You'll find more total food savings each and every week at all Dan's Supreme Supermarkets. The wind's contact number Judson two six four zero five. This is Stan Bernard. Contact you're on the air. Go right ahead. You there? No, let's try the next one, please. This is Contact. You're on the air. Uh, I'd like to address my question to Malcolm. 
I'd like to know, sir, why do you still use your ex? And as far as the uh, public opinion about you, maybe it's because of your abrupt change to the black Muslim group to form your own national group that the public is sort of like, they don't exactly know uh, where you stand. I mean, they figured, like you said before, that you were with the uh, black Muslim and you were uh, definitely with Mohammed. I'm sure that some of the public feel that now that you're with someone else, that they're sort of like uh, influencing you as far as your beliefs are concerned. That's why I've been uh, very slow since I returned from Africa to really uh, go all out in the formation, or rather I should say the, yes, the formation of the two organizations in which I'm involved. If you recall, when I was in Mecca, I wrote a letter back saying that when I came, when I returned to America, I wouldn't rest until I exposed Elijah Muhammad as the religious faker that he was. I was 100% sincere in saying that. But when I returned, one of the reasons that, I've avo that I initially avoided any kind of discussion or, or talk about Elijah Muhammad and the black Muslim movement after leaving Mecca, uh, rather before going to Mecca, I had an hour and a half conversation with President Nasser in Egypt. After leaving Mecca, I had, I spent three hours with President Julius Nyeri in Tan what was then Tanganyika, is now Tanzania. I spent, uh, a couple of days with President Jomo Kenyatta and, uh, uh, the Prime Minister Milton Obote of Uganda and also President Azikwe in, uh, Nigeria, President Nkrumah in Ghana, President Sekoutere in, uh, in Guinea. And I had an opportunity to discuss the problem of black people on the African continent plus uh, the, the plight of our people in this country. And, and uh, I, will not, I will, won't hesitate to say that conversations with these men broadened my scope tremendously beyond what it was before I went over there. And I felt when I came back that uh, the many uh, things that I had learned would be constructive or could, or could be used constructively by black people in this country in our struggle for human dignity. And I felt that I would be wasting my time entering into some kind of dispute with Elijah Muhammad and his followers. And so I spent my time, when I first came back here, trying to get the organization of Afro-American unity consolidated, plus the Muslim mosque, which is based upon Orthodox Islam. But the black Muslim movement was fearful that if I was ever left alone long enough to get my feet firmly planted on the ground and get our program out here in the public, that it would uh, be too much competition for what they had already projected or had in mind. Let me ask you this, Malcolm. Uh, you at one time espoused complete separation of the, of the, of the race. I must say this, in what, concerning what Elijah Muhammad say about, said about separation. He didn't espouse separation. What he said was this, that the government should, if the government can't give complete equality right now, then the government should permit black people to go back to Africa. He didn't ever say back to Africa. Elijah Muhammad has never made one statement that's pro-African, and he has never in any of his speeches or written or oral said anything to his followers about Africa. What he, about a black he, state he, in the United States? He was as anti-African as he was anti-white. Did you say a black state in the no, United States? No, so what he said was we should go back to our own, and he, he phrased it like that because if he spelled it out, he would have to point to some geographic area, and he would have to have the consent of the people in that geographic a area, which he knew he couldn't get. So he just kept it elusive and said, let's go back to our own. And if, if the government wouldn't let us go back to our own, then he said separation should set up right here. But at no time did he ever enter into any kind of activity or action that was designed to bring any of this into existence. And it was this lack of action that uh, led many of the activists within the movement to become disillusioned and dissatisfied and eventually leave it. Let's go right back to the phone. So when's contact number? Judson 26405. This is Stan Bernard. Contact, you're on the air. Uh, I'd like to direct my question to Malcolm. Yes. Uh, I've traced the uh, Muslim history. I'm a student in college right now. I've done some research on this, and uh, I've heard a lot about the FRI, the secret police, and I've tried to dig up some information on it, but everywhere the information has eluded me. I wonder if Malcolm could fill me in on some of the details of the FRI. Well, in this uh, article by Aubrey in this week's Saturday Evening Post, he point, points out, I think it's pointed out beautifully for the first time, too, that the FOI was not a special group among the Muslims, but every Muslim male, when he became a registered follower, of Elijah Muhammad uh, was an FOI. And, uh, but the press got the impression that it was a special or select group uh, within the Muslims that constituted the FOI. So there's your answer. And, and I might even point out, too, that uh, if you go back and examine the Muslim philosophy 
and its general overall temperament up until 1960, you'll find that it was a group of people who tried to practice religion. I don't think that the real rot set in until after 1960. This is why I was pointing out to Mr. Hall that it began to deteriorate and decline after 1960. What well, were some of the rules, Aubrey, that you had a, you came in contact with? Uh, you used to read uh, the charges, uh, according to your article, against people who were brought up by charges in your mosque. You go back and examine the Muslim philosophy and its general overall temperament up until 1960, you'll find that it was a group of people who tried to practice religion. I don't think that the real rot set in until after 1960. This is why I was pointing out to Mr. Hall that it began to deteriorate and decline after 1960. What were some but, of the rules, Aubrey, that you had a, you came in contact with? Uh, you used to read uh, the charges, uh, according to your article, against people who were brought up by charges in your mosque. What kind of rules were they that were broken? Well, uh, the black Muslims have their own rules and regulations that each member must follow. Uh, they have such strict rules as you can't go to the theater, you couldn't go to a sporting event, uh, you couldn't uh, attend a Christian funeral or even a Christian wedding, even if it was a relative of yours. Now, there's a very specific reason they do this. Uh, there are two reasons. One reason is because it costs money to do these things, and the other thing, other reason is they're teaching total dissatisfaction with the present society. So that if you can do anything to gain any satisfaction whatsoever from today's society, then you're, going, uh, you're contradicting what they are teaching. So a member would be punished. Uh, he could be put out of the mosque or punished in other ways for going to a theater. Gordon, and for ad uh, adultery or fornication, uh, if a Muslim man or woman had anything to do whatsoever uh, with any uh, man or woman to whom he or she was not married, uh, that person would be given from one to five years out of the society. That is, they would be brought in front of the Muslim body and totally humiliated, uh, uh, which is a, uh, uh, the worst form of psychological treatment that you can receive. Then they would be isolated. Uh, into a category where they would have no intercourse whatsoever with the Muslim community for a solid year, and if they came back on probation, they'd be on probation for four, for four years. Now, in 1954, a young girl who was a secretary in Chicago uh, became pregnant, and she was brought in front of the Muslim community. She was humiliated. She was isolated by the judge, who was Elijah Muhammad. And uh, everyone took it for granted that the father of her child was a non-Muslim uh, because of the uh, other... Uh, half was never brought to trial. In 1956, uh, it happened to another young secretary in Chicago. In 1960, uh, it happened to four more young secretaries in Chicago. And everyone at each time took it for granted that this was, uh, that the father of these, uh, uh, offspring was a non-Muslim. I know the charge you're going to make. I'm not going to make uh, any charge because I, I know what your libel laws are. Yeah. I wouldn't say that, but here's what I'm pointing out. Anytime you find, uh, a judge who will sit on a bench, and a young girl will come before him, and that young girl will be charged with adultery, and he will humiliate her, almost uh, castigate her, and then sentence her into oblivion solely to keep the court from knowing that he himself is the father of her children. That judge is not only fit to be a judge, but he's not even a man, because he doesn't even accept the fatherhood of the children which he, has to, which he is responsible for having brought into this world. And this type of uh, rot is what caused the moral deterioration within the black Muslim movement today. Formally, if you notice, no matter what kind of criticism you had of the Muslims, they were disciplined morally. They, they didn't drink, they didn't smoke, they tried to show respect for people, uh, and uh, there was that uh, force within it, which was a spiritual force that made the rank and file one who believed in it capable of abstaining from many of the moral uh, weaknesses. But after the real faith, the, spirit, the religious side, or the real spiritual power began to fade, from the uh, black Muslim movement, the power that used to enable the brothers and sisters to uh, let their higher tendencies dominate rather than their lower tendencies, it was switched around. So that today, the reason you have so much incident of Muslim attacking Muslim is because the spiritual force that used to exist in the movement among the rank and file uh, is gone. So now you have an organized group of people who do not have the moral strength to rise above or contain themselves from falling victim to their own low desires. Gordon? This is, this is, you know, I wish we had time. This is such a bundle of contradictions. All these words. Malcolm is the greatest one in the world for eating up the clock. He does it every time that I sit across the table from him. Now, he said at the outset that Aubrey X's piece, or Aubrey Barnett's piece, is a wonderful piece. And Aubrey says that the religious emphasis in the Muslim movement was a total fraud from start to finish. And no, now we're getting well, the no, story no, no, about no, 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 this great no, uplift no, and the deterioration. No, 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 no. The religious, uh, uh, 
uh, ingredient in the black Muslim movement was a fraud in the sense that it identified itself as an Islamic movement, as an Islamic, uh, of, of being of an Islamic nature. It was a fraud in that, that it had, it was diametrically opposed to Islam. It was, uh, Elijah Muhammad himself is anti-Arab. He's more anti-Arab than probably the Israelis are. Now, when I say about the religion, the religion, sir, is belief in something. You don't have to be of a specific persuasion I'm well aware for it of to that. be a religion. You so, don't have to define uh, the, it. No, what the black Muslims believe in, they believe in it religiously. We believed in Yaqub. We believed in uh, uh, what Elijah Muhammad taught about an airplane up in the sky. We believed in I some know. of the most fantastic things that you could ever imagine. Uh, so we believed in it, because with us it was a religion. I, I have a question about the New York City Police Department. Uh, they would like to tell you that they have a new telephone number for public use in any emergency. Uh, if you need emergency police or ambulance service, dial 440-1234. That's 440-1234 for emergency police or ambulance service. Remember that number, 440-1234 for emergency police or ambulance service. We're going to continue in just a moment, uh, Gordon. Wait one second. I want to say a word about the tomorrow night on Stan Bernard Contact. We have a beautiful show tomorrow night, probably the most beautiful show we've ever done. We are collecting models for the show. It's been my pleasure to collect a, a bevy of beautiful women. We're going to be doing a show on modeling in New York. And uh, what does it take to become a model, and how difficult is it to find success? Well, you get the answers from Candy Jones, beauty expert, teacher, and representative for models, and from the girls themselves, the successful models of all types and ages. That's modeling tomorrow night. 10.30 on Stan Bernard Contact. One more thing. East side, west side, all around the town. Another money-saving ShopRite supermarket comes to Patterson, New Jersey at 142, 160 West Broadway in Patterson. They're open now and ready to serve you everything you could possibly want in meats, fish, shellfish, fresh produce, canned and frozen foods, baked goods, and dairy products. And there's a convenient service appetizer department, too. There's plenty of free parking, and the store is open late every night of the week. If you can't get to Patterson, get to the ShopRite supermarket nearest you and cash in on the carnival of grand opening celebration values. So why pay more? Gordon, you can say something? One of the distressing aspects of a discussion like this with limited time <laughs> is that with this great outpouring of words on the part of someone like Malcolm, an average listener, both Negro and white, might get the idea that this is what life is all about in the Negro community. And this isn't what life is all about in the Negro community. We're still talking about a handful of Muslims and a much smaller handful of followers of Malcolm. Well, I want to ask you a question, though. Uh, you know, we were talking about, we were talking about terror. We are talking about yes. terror. Malcolm X says uh, that he's, in a sense, terrorized. Uh, he's not frightened. No, but, wait a minute. Well, no, no, well, I, terrorized I, how? No, no I, I don't mean, mean, I don't mean you're terrorized. scared. I don't mean you're scared. I mean, well, I'm not threats terrorized been, no, either. Threats have been made on your life. Well, that's still, threats are a far cry from me being terrorized. No, well, a man, a man, somebody can run down the street at you, and uh, he can... Uh, threaten you, and you can call it, you can stick a label on it, and you can say that somebody is terrorizing a community, yes. and uh, they can be indeed, but and you can say that, uh, well, then you're not frightened. That's okay. With all due you're respect to you, sir, okay, nobody fine. is terrorizing me. Okay, you're not terrorized, and, uh, but you are being threatened. Yes. Let's accept that. Yes. You are being threatened five times, you say, recently in your house has been bombed. Uh, you're an, an, an expert on extremist organizations, Gordon Hall. And I get threatened, I might add, a good deal. And the last place that I take threats on my body, and I have also been beaten up very badly, too, the last place that I take them is to the press to tell them all about it because it gives other people ideas. I keep these things to myself. This is one of the hazards of being in the field that I am in, and I don't go announcing it to the press every chance that I get. That's, uh, well, your attitude. You announce it uh, all the time. Why? No, I have not announced it all the time. Mm -hmm. I have answered the charges made by the black Muslim movement on 116th Street. Mm -hmm. The charges? The charges that I'm seeking publicity and, and, and pretending to be threatened. What did you do when you were beaten, Aubrey? Oh. Did, you, what, did it get into the papers right away? It, uh, it got into the papers, but in a distorted way. Uh, the papers unfortunately accepted the black Muslim view of what had happened. And as I uh, said before, I was immediately labeled, uh, labeled as a rival of the black Muslims, although I had left the movement and forgotten all about them, I thought. I Why were labeled, you labeled as a rival of the black Muslims? I was labeled as a uh, rival of the black Muslims because the, I think the black Muslims needed a scapegoat. They needed someone to, to point to as an enemy, as all mass movements do. They have to have an enemy, and a mass movement can exist without a god, but we can't, it can't exist without a devil. What I was getting at, sir, is they tried to identify you with me. Uh, yes. And any time you were identified, the only time Elijah Muhammad gets favorable publicity is in when it's against me. They side with him, and anything his followers do 
as long as it's against me. <laughs> Gordon? A cogent point, I hope, about the press. Uh, I've had a good deal to do with the press, too, and I've written a good many articles for the press. One of the reasons that the press is confused about these things is here you have people running around with phony names and initials like X on their name with yeah. unlisted telephone numbers engaging in all sorts of counter-charges of conspiracy and counter-conspiracies. It's little wonder that the press is confused. The members themselves of these movements are confused. No, the, the press, press, no, no, the press, the press is confused. The press wrote articles about me, though, using my name, address, age, and everything else, but without ever once consulting me and labeling me as a black nationalist, when I've never joined any black nationalist organization or any other organization after I left the black Muslims. No, General, the press is more frightened of the black nationalists than of the black Muslims. And if you doubt it, all you have to do is pick up any story written that involves black Muslims and, and black nationalists, and you'll always find the press slants it skillfully in favor of the black Muslims, despite the fact that the black Muslim movement teaches that every white individual that comes into the world is a devil by nature, by nature. And the black nationalists don't do that. The black nationalists judge people by their uh, behavior, by their deeds, not by their color. But still, the press knows that the black Muslim movement is a hybrid, a hybrid, political and religious hybrid that will never do anything against the Ku Klux Klan or against the organized white elements in this society that are brutalizing black people. But that same black Muslim movement will give the order for black people within it to murder and cripple uh, uh, other black people in the community. The black Muslim movement has never at any time been involved in any kind of strike against the Ku Klux Klan or the Citizens Council even in the South or the North, but they, they give the orders to fight each other. When a brother was killed in Los Angeles, no order was given. In fact, the brothers who wanted to go into action were restrained. Many of them right here in New York by little fat Joseph was restrained, were restrained. But that same Joseph gives his crew orders to go out and cripple other black persons who have left the movement through dissatisfaction over what they've learned. This is yours truly, WINS, the Group W station, Westinghouse Broadcasting for New York. We're going to get back to the subject in just about a minute and a half. It's 36 degrees in New York under cloudy skies. This is Stan Bernard with the Winds 1130 report. Twenty-four persons, most of them youngsters, were arrested today in the second day of rioting in Brooklyn over alleged school segregation. Some 300 Negro teenagers and youths ran wild through downtown Brooklyn, battling police, smashing windows, and terrorizing pedestrians. Board of Education President James Donovan warns that leaders of the school boycotts which led to the riots would be arrested along with any children who did not attend classes. Donovan called the boycott leaders Pied Pipers who were seeking personal publicity. Severe weather is hampering efforts to help more than 100 men at a mine in British Columbia sealed off by snow and ice. 17 men were rescued, but as many as 23 others may still be buried. The body of explorer James Mitchell was buried under tons of rock and dirt that caved in in attempts to bring out the 23-year-old explorer at Dolgeville, New York. Mitchell was trapped Saturday, and efforts to save him were futile in sports. NFL owners beating in Palm Desert, California, have approved a 40-man player limit and for the first time in history recognized the so-called taxi squad. In the NBA, Boston 119, St. Louis 109, after three quarters, Los Angeles 90, Philadelphia 82. In college basketball, Drake 72, Bradley 57, NYU 78, Georgetown 73, Manhattan 80, Temple 65, and Holy Cross 100, Massachusetts 84. The wind's weather word, partly cloudy, then becoming fair tomorrow, colder with a high in the upper 30s, Clear and cold tomorrow night, below 20 to 25. And for Saturday, fair and continued seasonably cold. The current temperature, 36 degrees. And that's the Winds 1130 Report, San Bernard reporting. What is a black Muslim besides a Negro? And what is the movement? Is it a bona fide religion or just a terror organization? Tonight on Stan Bernard Contact, we're discussing black nationalism and the black Muslim movement. And my guest tonight, Malcolm X, also in the studio, Aubrey Barnett, a former black Muslim official from Boston. He's also split with the organization. And my third guest, Gordon Hall, an expert on extremist organizations. I think we ought to go right back to the telephone and uh, see what's doing out there because we haven't taken very many phone calls. I have to apologize. We've really been very uh, wordy in the studio tonight and battling it out in here. This is Contact. You're on the air. Hello, may I speak with Mr. X? Yes. Mr. X? Yes. Oh, it's just so wonderful to hear you. I've been, attended several of your meetings. And if prayer will save you and your family, there will never be any harm to you. Thank you. And I admire you for what you've done for these little black children. You'll be surprised. They are glad to be blacked out. Thank you. So God bless you. Whatever God it may be, any supreme being, protect you and your family. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your call. All right. This is Contact. You're on the air. Yes, I'd like to uh, address a question to Malcolm. I'd like to ask him 
why, after his suspension, then his decision to lead the Muslim movement, then he decided to tell all. Why did he not tell his people about the children, the misappropriation of funds? So what purpose is it going to serve now? And uh, secondly, why does he think someone wants to take his life? What purpose is it going to serve? Uh, this is a very good question. When I, uh, first, the black Muslim, one thing that the black Muslim movement did, positive, uh, here in this country, the militancy that it projected uh, made the black people in this country more militant than they had ever been. The whole civil rights struggle was affected by the general posture uh, reflected or projected by the black Muslim movement. When I first came into the knowledge of the crisis within Elijah Muhammad's family in Chicago and what it would mean to the black Muslim movement if it were out, I chose myself to remain silent because I'm not to save Elijah Muhammad, but I felt I was uh, afraid of the psychological harm it would do his followers, plus the effect it would have on the struggle uh, that black people in, are waging in this country, period. When I first left the movement, I left and took the full blame. I even made uh, it appear that I was leaving. I never left the black Muslim movement. I was put out. And because the law in the movement is that when a person is put out, they must first be brought before the membership and given a hearing Elijah Muhammad was afraid to bring me before the membership and give me a hearing for fear of what I might say in my own defense. So, it, so I was put in limbo, so to speak, suspended, and the uh, Muslims in the temple here in New York were told that I would be back in 90 days. But at the same time they were being told that I would be back in 90 days, brothers were sent out by Joseph to take my life. And those brothers are with me now. The police know about it. This is a fact. And uh, uh, it was only after it, in, it was only after I was out of the movement, and then Elijah Muhammad began to use the every pulpit in every temple in the nation to blaspheme against me. Plus, Muhammad speaks newspaper to poison the minds of his followers into thinking that I had actually committed some kind of treacherous deed against him. That I felt it necessary for me to tell his followers the real reason for which I came out of the movement, and I've been doing that ever since. Gordon. Uh, you're a professional observer of, of, of extremist organizations, and you classify the black nationalists and, of course, the Muslims as extremist organizations. How do you uh, appraise uh, this, this political warfare that's going on in the black nationalist organization? Well, to be perfectly frank with you, and I do believe in speaking frankly, I think at the moment uh, the Muslims are a dying uh, organization. They're on the way out. Uh, they've made no impact in the, in the Negro community nationally at any point, and even less so now. Malcolm has no place to go, which is why he's floundering so badly. For example, he's been breaking bread with the communists downtown. What com Wait a minute. What communists have I been Socialist breaking? Workers' Party. You're, you're absolutely out of your mind. You, I have never broken bread. You have given any... several speeches, which they well, have that's not reprinted. Bread. I, sp I speak anywhere. I spoke in London, uh, England. Uh, you were very, you were very proud to go back several times, and they're reprinting one of your major addresses in a militant. I spoke in a church. I spoke in a church in, no, in, in Rochester about, a couple nights ago. Does about that make churches. me a Methodist? We're not talking about churches. We're talking about... The Socialist Workers' Party, the which part is... That you, just because you speak somewhere doesn't make you that. You speak to the public, and you speak on any platform. Oh, I don't, Malcolm. And I speak to the public, and I speak on any platform. I'm afraid, now, I'm if, afraid that's not if, the case, If Malcolm. speaking on the socialist platform makes me a socialist, then when I speak in a Methodist There's church... There's a communist platform. I was in Selma, Alabama uh, last week speaking in Martin Luther King's church. Does that make me a follower of Martin Luther King? You are very no, your, your line of reasoning, sir, doesn't no, fit me. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that I was asked a question by Stan, and I think that I at, at the you. moment the nationalist movement has no place to go. They're floundering and they're putting out lines everywhere. And there is an alliance in the general Harlem area between some of the Peking-based communists, the progressive labor movement, and some of the others, the Bill Epton crowd. Bill Epton is a self-confessed, avowed communist. You'd agree to that, wouldn't you, Malcolm? I know nothing about what Bill Epton's uh, political philosophy is. Bill Epton, in my opinion, is one of the militant leaders in Harlem. Now, what his political beliefs are, I think that he has a right to them. I didn't say he didn't have and a right. I'm just saying what he is. Well, uh, and he has stated to me whatever personally. They are. I've interviewed him. He told me he's an avowed communist. So, whatever they are, he has he'd a like, right to he'd them. He'd like to see the system of ours completely junked as well. All I'm saying is that there's a lot well, of I think you'll find that a lot of the children speak, that are Malcolm? out there in may Brooklyn I, may I speak? are, are, may I speak? are uh, on the rampage against the segregated school system here in New York City. May I speak? And King and some of his followers in Alabama right now are fighting against the same system. But you don't let other people speak, now. Well, they your words. I, no, I, I'm trying to. You would be kind enough to let me speak. Go right ahead, Go ahead Mr. Hall. 
Well, at any Dr. rate, uh, they, they're floundering now, and there's a lot of internecine warfare going on in the Harlem section, and most of the movements are small and splintered, and there are splinters of splinters, and I suppose only the future will tell uh, which one will emerge victorious and perhaps claim the most members. I would make a prediction, and I think we could come back a year from now, uh, Stan, and, and I think you may find Malcolm preaching a completely separate doctrine of... Uh, leading some other kind of a movement. Well, you know, one of the best compliments that um, Dr. Hall here can pay me is just what, just the things that he says. When he begins to pat me on the back, I'll be worried. I'm not patting you on the back. When a person, I told I you said, up in I Boston said, that said, when you give begin, a little time and you'll be preaching a new line, I and you said, are. Begin, when you begin to pat me on the back, I'll be worried. When you begin, people of your profession, who make a profession out of dealing with uh, groups in this country, uh, when you begin to pat me on the back, then I'll be worried, sir. Well, now, I would I advise you, if you think that nationalism has no influence whatsoever, the Nationalists, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, are having a rally at the Audubon Ballroom on no, Broadway. You mentioned it earlier. You're getting in a couple I'm of I'm going to mention blocks. it again, <laughs> that uh, I wouldn't come on the program and not mention it, okay. because uh, uh, one of the most difficult things for nationalists to do is to let the public know what they're doing. So we're having this rally at the Audubon. I know the public is engaged in a vast conspiracy against you. It's you're going to make so me mention it four or five times. We're having, this rally, <laughs> we're, having this, we're having this rally at the Audubon Ballroom this coming Sunday at 2 o'clock, and people just like you who consider themselves experts on nationalists are uh, given front seat invitations. And I would advise you, since it's your profession to know what nationalists and other so-called extremists are doing, to come and be our guests. Now, one thing I'd like to point out too, Dr. Hall. Whenever you find you black... perfectly well, I'm not a doctor, Malcolm. Well, so you sound like an right. expert on something. I thought you were a doctor. Uh, uh, you, uh, whenever you find uh, the condition that black people are confronted by in this country, being permitted by the government to exist so long, the condition in itself is extreme. And any black man who really feels about uh, this situation that our people are confronted by, his feelings are extreme. You can't take a, a cough syrup and cure somebody who has pneumonia, and the black people are becoming more extreme every day. I was in, little, I was in uh, Alabama uh, a couple of weeks ago before I went to England, uh, down there with Dr. King and some of the others who are trying to uh, just register and vote. Now, I'll tell you frankly, uh, with King is supposed to be the most moderate, most conservative, most loving, most endorsed, most supported. Now the word is responsible, but go ahead. Okay, responsible to the white power structure. To me, when white people talk about responsible, no, it's a responsible American. That's when, 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 when people like you usually refer to Negroes as responsible, you mean Negroes who are responsible in the context of your type of thinking. So, getting right back to Dr. King. Anytime you find a person who goes along with the government to the degree that Dr. King does, and still Dr. King's followers, children, are made to run down the road by brute policemen uh, who are nothing but Klansmen, and the federal government can step in and do nothing about it, I will guarantee you that you are producing extremists by the thousands. Now, when I was down there, they would permit, they wanted me to speak to the press, but didn't want me to speak to the church or the children or the students. Let me ask and you, it was Malcolm. the students themselves that insisted that I speak that gave me the opportunity Malcolm, to speak. Malcolm, how do you think that's going to be changed? Sir, uh, I, I, I do, how? I mean, no, I, I know you're talking about these children being made into extremists, but how, or, how is that situation going to be changed? Not, do you think by warfare? Not, it's not going to be uh, changed by uh, making believe that it doesn't exist to the intense degree that it exists, and it's not going to be changed by, by putting out polls like Newsweek magazine did la uh, last week, implying that Negroes are satisfied with the rate of progress. This is deluding yourself. And my contention is that white people do themselves a disservice by putting out these kind of things to make it appear that Negroes are satisfied when the most explosive situation racially that has ever existed in this country exists right now. And all of your so-called responsible leaders, when they speak about the situation, they say everything is in check. Yet every day you find uh, Negro children becoming more explosive yeah, but you're than they've ever been before. You're not answering my question. Uh, you're avoiding it. Uh, I asked you, how is it going to change? Is it going to change uh, through... Uh, extreme behavior, extreme, let's call it extreme reaction. Uh, in other words, you are going to react extremely to a situation that you don't like. Now, how extreme can your reaction be? Well, sir, when Russia put missiles in Cuba, mm -hmm. the only thing that made Russia get her missiles out of Cuba was when America pointed missiles right back at Russia. Are you suggesting revolution? I'm, no, I'm saying this, that when you respect the intelligence of black people in this country as being equal to that of whites, then you will realize that the reaction of the black man to oppression 
will be the same as the reaction of the white man to oppression. The white man will not turn the other cheek when he's being oppressed. He will not practice any kind of love of a clan or a citizen council or anyone else. But at the same time, the white man is asking the black man to do this. So all I'm saying is, I absolutely believe the situation can be changed. But I don't think it can be changed by white people taking a, a hypocritical approach, pretending that it is not as bad as it is, and by black leaders, so-called responsible leaders, taking a hypocritical approach, trying to make white people think that black people are patient and long-suffering and are willing to sit around here a long time or a great deal of time longer until the problem is, 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 is made better. Let's go back to the phone. The wind's contact number, idea. Judson 26405. This is contact. You're on the air. Hello, Malcolm. Yes. The Ku Klux Klan should get you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let me, let me, point, this, let me point something out to this lady. I'm invited to Mississippi next week. I'll be going to Mississippi next week. The Ku Klux Klan will have all the opportunity it wants to get me. I was in Alabama last week. They had an opportunity then. You don't always have to go down south to find the Ku Klux Klan. Evidently, one is your father, or you wouldn't be able to speak as you do. This is contact. You're on the air. Yes, I'd like to ask you, Mr. I had a question. In Louis Lomax's book, When the Word is Given, he says, none of the rumors about Muslims receiving help from outside, communist or segregationist sources, has proved true. Does Mr. Barnett have any information that will verify or refute that statement? I didn't quite get it, but Mr. Barnett has left the room. He's left the studio during this last part of the debate, and he's not here to answer it. Can Mr. Hall answer it? Uh, can Mr. Hall answer it? I didn't quite understand your question. Can you quote that again for us? Uh, yes. Louis Lomax says that none of the rumors about Muslims receiving help from outside, communist or segregationist sources, have proved true. And I'd like to know what they think about this. I would agree with uh, Mr. Lomax's statement on that. I think that's an actual statement. I'm not so sure that that, that is applicable to other uh, militant groups in the Negro community, but I think it's applicable to the Muslims. I'm not sure. Because they don't get any help from outside sources. She was talking about outside communist or yeah. segregationist sources. Yeah. Do they get any help from inside segregationist sources? I would, doubt the that, expert. I would doubt that very much. I have no evidence of it, and neither do you. And if you do, then I'm not saying put up, I do. Malcolm. But you're, not, you're implying. You're a very no, fly implier. You, are you I, cause you give me the impression, all of a sudden, that you're a protector of the black Muslim movement. Not a bit. When, not a bit. When it comes to rallying, ra rallying them against the black nationalists, because you know that the black Muslim movement is in a bag and has no I'm place the to one, go. I'm the one, just to show you how no, faulty no, your logic no, 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 is. No, 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 let no, me sir. speak. Just to show you how faulty your logic is, I arranged for the Saturday Evening Post story, which you have praised with your own mouth tonight, is the best thing ever written on not the black Muslim. Not because you arranged it. I arranged it's the best. Not because you arranged it. I arranged it. That doesn't make it best. It's, the, it's, it's best because but if I were, it, wrote Mr. Hall is saying that he arranged for it to be written because he thought it was valid and what valuable. What he uh, arranged, uh, what he did is immaterial to me. I'm not yes, commenting you're on... Not, you, you never want to louse up an argument with sir, facts, Malcolm. I'm not commenting on what you did. It's immaterial to me. But you said it was a wonderful thing. I'm piece. saying that what Aubrey did, Aubrey is the one who did the piece. You can yes, arrange for Rockwell Aub to write a piece. Aubrey came to me you can arrange because for Rockwell he knew that I could get the story told in the best fashion. You can arrange for Rockwell. You can arrange for the Klan to write a piece. No, I could not. So that, that I doesn't, could not. What you can arrange doesn't impress me. Malcolm, you know perfectly well that I could, not just yes, a you smear. Could. You could, sir. Oh. <laughs> you're a mercenary. Fancy the technique no, you're a professional. You said that yourself. That's why I call the doctor. Can we go on to our next call? No. I like him when he talks this way because he exposes himself. No, I'm idiot. exposing you as a mercenary. Here we go, An fellas. opportunist. It's the next call time. Here we go. This is contact. You're on the air. Uh, I'd like to direct a question to Malcolm X. Go ahead. Uh, I've heard him on a newsreel say that Charlie's enemies are his enemies, and uh, this was supposed to refer to the white man as Charlie. Charlie is the Ku Klux Klan and the White Citizens Council. Right. And, and white people who practice discrimination and segregation against black people. Right. Then I'd like to ask you um, something about what you mentioned about AIDS from Red China. I've never mentioned anything about AIDS from Red China. Right. Ask Dr. Hall. He's an expert. I think he'll even have to agree to that. Excuse me, I ask you if, um, if the aid to fight Charlie came from the Red Chinese, would you accept it? And you said from anybody. Well, that doesn't specify Red China. When you were, I said this, that when you're in the uh, den of a wolf and a fox comes along and asks you for help or offers to help you, you'll accept help from any source available against that wolf. Right. Yeah, but uh, they ask This you doesn't mean that you love foxes. 
Did they to specify? It doesn't mean that you love foxes. Did they specify when they asked you the question whether it was whether you would accept? I don't think they said the Chinese Communist China. They did. I, if I recall, and I could be wrong, but I but if I recall, I don't think they said uh, specified Communist China. But although although, let me say this about Communist China: China is a nation of seven hundred million people. Physically, they exist. Physically, they exist. I don't go along with the American uh, uh, reaction of pretending that seven hundred million Chinese don't exist. When I was in China, Africa during the summer, everywhere I looked, I saw Chinese. It's only when I get back to America that I don't, that I don't see any Chinese. I just don't think it's mature to pretend that 700 million people don't exist. That doesn't happen to be U.S. policy to pretend that they don't exist. Now, can you just say things not, that aren't so? No, well, I mean... The United States is well aware of Red China. She certainly is. They just detonated some nuclear bombs over there. The, 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 Plus, they her don't forces exist. have the United States soldiers tied down in... Uh, in Saigon, she'd have to be well aware. She has half your forces tied up. Well, well you'd be crazy not to be aware of her existence. North but at the same time, you're trying to give the public impression over here, the people, the, uh, the impression over here that they don't exist. You're just saying that. That's not they're, the case at all. They're human beings, the same as you and I are. So you, you of course, espouse recognition of the Red China and admission to the United mm -hmm. Nations. Many of your senators in Washington, D.C. espouse the same thing. I think most intelligent, progressive uh, people who are up to date in their thinking have uh, finally reached uh, intellectual and political maturity to the point where they feel that when you got a, that many people on this earth, you better recognize them and deal with them as human beings, and then they will deal with you as human beings. If you say that you shouldn't deal with them because they are communists, then you, why deal with Russia? Or if you say that they shouldn't, you shouldn't deal with them because they fought United Nations forces in Korea, then why deal with Shombi? Shombi also fought United Nations uh, forces in, in, in Katanga. If you, if you use the same yardstick to measure these people all of the time, I think you'll end up with better results. All right, let's go on to our next call. Our WIS contact number, Judson 26405. This is Stan Bernard Contact. You're on the air. Hello. Yes. Uh, Malcolm, I'd like to ask you whether you feel that uh, the uh, uh, recent action of the Gaulist government in refusing your entry into France is in any way inconsistent with France's general policy towards uh, the Afro-Asian community and Africa in particular. Yes, I uh, dispatched a wire to Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State here today, uh, demanding an investigation into the reason why the French government uh, could ban an American citizen and no uh, uh, reaction come from the American embassy whatsoever. But I might point out, I was in Paris last uh, November and was successful in organizing uh, a good organization, which another one that uh, Dr. Hall over here can investigate in his capacity, uh, in the American Negro community in Paris. And they have been working in conjunction with the African community, and it was the African community and the Afro-American community in Paris that invited me there to address a mass rally. And the French government permitted my entry into that country. And I might point out that it was the communist trade union workers in Paris that re refused to let them have the hall initially, blocked their attempt to get the second hall, and eventually exercised influence in the French government to stop it. But the communist trade unions wor union workers, one of the largest unions in that country. And, uh, and the reason I was in London, I had been invited there to attend the first con Congress that had been given by the Council of African Organizations, who, were in who, invi who had a four-day Congress, invited me to make the closing address because they were interested in the struggle of the black man in this country in his quest for human dignity and human rights. Okay, we're going to move on to our next call. This is Contact. You're on the air. Hello? Yes. Uh, may I speak to Malcolm X, please? Yes, go right ahead. Uh, I would like to, uh, I don't have a question for Malcolm X. I would like to tell him that I am 100% uh, with him uh, for whatever he goes along with uh, to helping the Negroes. And uh, I think it's an awful shame that uh, anyone should uh, bomb or throw a bomb into a, a house uh, where there is human beings, particularly children, and uh, I don't go along at all with the uh, Muslim, um, so-called Muslims at all, because to me they're only teaching hate. Well, I confess that I was one of the leaders in, in projecting the Muslim movement and, and uh, causing so many people to believe in the, in the distorted version of Islam that is taught there, but at the same time I have to point out that there are some progressive elements, right-meaning persons in the black Muslim movement. Uh, all of them do, are, are not wrong. There are many in there who mean well, but are just being misled by the hierarchy, many of which do not mean well. But there are, is a, a large progressive element within the movement, 
And usually they are the ones who come in, they stay a year, and they, and they get disillusioned, and they go back out. But I was responsible for giving the people the impression that the black movement was more than what it is, and I take that responsibility. You can put the complete blame upon me. But at the same time that I take that responsibility, I want to point out that no white man or white group or agency can use me against Elijah Muhammad or against the black Muslim movement. When you hear me open up my mouth against another black man, cannot, no white man can put words in my mouth, nor no white man can sick me on another black group. When I have analyzed the man and the group with my own understanding, and feel that it is detrimental to the interest of the black community, then I'm going to attack it uh, with that same intensity. Gordon, you were going to well, say Well, again, as you know, it's more words, and uh, he began by saying that uh, he has to confess that he was responsible for misleading so many people on the Muslim count. There were never very many Muslims. Let's always come back to the fact that not very many people were ever misled. The white press was misled into believing Dr. there were a lot Hall. of Muslims. Dr. Hall. There were never more than 15,000 Muslims Dr. in America Hall. And there, were, there are only now 6,000, and we have 22 million Negroes in the United States. Keep Dr. these facts Dr. Hall, uppermost in one's mind. Well, you, you admitted this at the very beginning, Malcolm. Well, you said the 15,000 figure here is here correct. Here's another fact. These are facts, Malcolm. Here's, here's another fact you have to keep in mind. There never were many Mau Mau. There never were. There were always more Kikuyu, more Kenyans than Mau Mau. What is this supposed to prove? But it was the Mau Mau who brought independence to Kenya. Yes, but and the man who was uh, regarded as an extremist and a monster just five years ago, Jomo Kenyatta, mm -hmm. is the president of, of uh, the Republic of Kenya today. And it is this same man who five the years ago... The situation in please, colonial sir, Africa is not like it is in the United well, States. Well, this is colonial. Anytime you have a system in 1965 that will take children and let them be marched down the road by not... Yeah, but uh, in, elements, in numbers, in numbers but, you, have to, you have to draw one big analogy. In the United States, the Negro is still the minority in the United States. And, and when you're talking about minorities within minorities within minorities, well, you start boiling uh, it all down. Uh, you I can't say, really draw that analogy of a colony. This. I say this, that the Mau Mau was, was also a minority, a microscopic minority, but it was the Mau Mau who not only brought independence to Kenya, within but it, a vast Negro majority. But it brought, brought but it's still, that, that uh, wick, the powder keg is always larger than the wick. The smallest thing in the powder keg is the wick. You can touch the powder all day long and nothing happens. It's the wick that you touch that sets the powder to. off. I think it will blow up. It's the wick <laughs> that you touch that sets the powder off. And Good. if you go here in Holland and you take all these moderate uh, Negroes that uh, Dr. Hall here puts the stamp of approval on and regards them as responsible, they don't explode. It's the wick. It's that small element that you refer to as nationalists and other... But you're doing uh, all you can to encourage it now. Not encourage it. Whether you're in front of it or in Democratic language. No, no. I don't, yes, I, I'm not, I don't encourage it, but I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it doesn't exist. I'll don't you, you, I'll don't you incite, Malcolm? Don't I don't you think incite? so. I don't think. How are you going to in incite people who are living in slums and ghetto? It's the city structure that incites. A city that continues to let people live in rat nest dens in Harlem and pay higher rent in Harlem than they pay downtown. This is what incites it. Uh, who lets merchants outcharge or overcharge people for, for their groceries and their clothing and other commodities in Harlem while you pay lesser for it downtown. This is what incites it. Well, a, a city that will not create some kind of employment for people who are barred from having jobs just because their skin is black. That's what incites it. Don't ever uh, accuse a black man for voicing his resentment and dissatisfaction over the criminal condition of his people as being responsible for inciting a situation. You have to indict the society that allows these things to exist. And this is where I differ with Dr. Hall. Well, in the well, we sense, differ in many places, Malcolm. This is not one of the many places, Dr. Hall, where we differ. Well, in a sense, didn't Hitler also talk about different points of view? Didn't he say that conditions existed? And didn't he also incite people? Well, I, I'm, I don't know anything about Hitler. Yeah. I, I wasn't in Germany. No, I'm in I'm America. Not, don't, don't, don't please. I say I no, wasn't in. I say I don't know anything about <laughs> Hitler. I wasn't in Germany, but I have. You know had, about Hitler. Well, though. you can't point to Hitler in Germany behind what's going on here in America. Turn on the television tonight and see what you don't, they're doing. You don't no, 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 no. Turn on the television tonight and see what they're doing with Dr. King. Mm -hmm. Turn on. No, this yes, is Dr. King's methods are not still, your methods. Still, Dr. King goes you along. You couldn't do in Alabama Dr. what he is doing, sir. You could not sir, do in Alabama. You better pray that I don't go and try and do what he's doing. Anytime Dr. King, oh, these are, these are just, these are anytime, words, anytime Dr. King goes along with people like you, like you, mm -hmm. you should put forth more effort to keep him out of jail. You should put forth more e effort to protect him. Then you should put forth more effort to protect the people who go along with him and display this love and this patience. 
if you would do more for those people and spend some of your time trying to help those people instead of trying to attack me, probably this country would be a much better place in which to live. You spend too much of your time, doctor. I really, trying to investigate. I rarely ever mention you, you Malcolm. You you're spend, hardly worth mentioning. You spend too much of your time, doctor, uh, running around trying to uh, keep track of dissatisfied black people whom you label as extremists. Hardly. Whereas hardly. if you would spend some of your time in, the, in these places where Dr. King is fighting, then you would make this country a better place to live in. Malcolm, I lectured all over the state of Alabama mm -hmm. when you had nothing to do with the Muslims. Did you have on a white sheet? Else. Did you have on a white sheet? Gentlemen, I, uh, time. Bell. Here we go. Bell. Okay, that's round 15. We just had it. Dr. Uh, Hall, come up to the Audubon Sunday at 2 o'clock. And we'll continue it from there. I have Gentlemen, important things to do. We have to move on. Time has run out. I'd like to thank all of you for showing up tonight. Thank you very much, Gordon. Malcolm, and of course, Aubrey Barnett.